And thank you for inviting me. It's a great honour to be asked to give this keynote address. It's also slightly embarrassing because there are several people in the audience who've published a lot more than I have on the subject. So I'm going to give you my personal experience uh, and discuss essentially what's changed in the last 20 years because I think a lot of things have changed for the better uh, and a few things for the worse. And I'm going to focus on Africa because that's where I've done all my work. There are plenty of other people here who are going to tell us about Asia later on. And I should just point out I'm not going to talk about the Fiebre study. Heidi Hopkins is going to talk about that tomorrow, I think. So I, was, I went to work in the Gambia in West Africa in 1978, and this was a malaria research unit, so I was told your job is to go to the gate clinic, uh, triage the patients waiting there, find those with malaria, send them in, and send the others to the health center. So I found this was rather difficult because they nearly all had fever, and it was difficult to tell whether they had malaria or not. And this was the ward, so most of those children came in with fever, and my senior colleague said, okay, it's, it's very simple. You treat them for malaria with chloroquine. If they're not better in three days, you give them a seven-day course of chloramphenicol. And if they're not better after that, you start them on TB treatment. So that was the advice I was given. Uh, luckily, we had good labs. Uh, so we could do blood films and parasite counts. And we also decided we should do blood cultures. And we found it wasn't quite as easy as, as I'd been told because quite a lot of those children had in, did indeed have malaria, positive blood film, but quite a lot of them also had, of those with malaria, also had positive blood cultures for salmonella. And there was, in fact, an association. So you can see here, the, this is a malaria season. So in the Gambia, the, the rainy season is about three months here. So all the cases of malaria there, and these were all the cases of invasive non-typhi salmonella infection, whereas stool carriage was fairly constant throughout the year. So just because they've got malaria doesn't mean they haven't got something else as well. So the next thing that happened, this man arrived in the Gambia. Anyone recognize this man? This is Pedro Alonso, uh, who is now head of malaria at WHO. So Pedro came out as a junior doctor, and we sent him to do the MSc in epidemiology at the London School, and he came back and did the first bed net trial uh, in, in which he showed that giving out permethrin impregnated bed nets plus chemoprophylaxis during the rainy season reduced all-cause mortality in children under five by 63%. So as a result of that study, bed nets were rolled out, and this shows the incidence of malaria worldwide and the mortality since 2000 up to 2015. So you can see an almost 40% decrease in incidence, 60% decrease in mortality due to malaria. This is a remarkable achievement, brought about largely by impregnated bed nets and artemisinin in combination treatment. Uh, and this is a map produced by the modelers showing, so this is 2000, this is 2015. Essentially, this reduction has occurred uh, throughout most of sub-Saharan Africa. So then we got rapid diagnostic tests for malaria. So WHO changed policy, I think, in 2009. So whereas previously... Jamie will correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, previously, all children with malaria in endemic areas should be treated with antimalarials. But as a result of chloroquine resistance spreading, switched to artemisinin combination treatment, much more expensive. And we now had the RDTs, so the recommendation was that all children should be tested with a rapid diagnostic test. And this is 2010, 2016. So the proportion of febrile children uh, in malaria endemic countries who were tested increased from about 40% to 
in 2010 to almost 80% in 2016. So we now had a way of diagnosing malaria in rural health centers without a microscope. So another great advance. Uh, and these are the IMCI guidelines uh, after that change. So a febrile child comes in, danger signs or a stiff neck, start antibiotics and antimalarials uh, and admit or refer. Positive malaria test, treat for malaria. Negative malaria test, give appropriate antibiotic for an identified cause of fever. The problem is, of course, that if you don't have a lab, you can't always identify what the cause of fever is. So what was the result of this change in recommendations? This is a paper by Heidi Hopkins. I'm sorry it hasn't come out very well, but this is a systematic review looking at the impact of introducing malaria rapid tests on prescription of antibiotics, showing that it led to a significant increase across malaria endemic countries. So when you introduce the RDTs, because of course most of the patients who had previously been treated for malaria didn't have malaria, what do you do? You don't know, so you give them an antibiotic. So this clearly has had important implications for the selection of antimicrobial resistance. So now I see Valerie and Blaise are now here. Oh, I think I saw them. Yeah, there, there they are, yes. So, so they're going to talk about this. So, so um, this was published when? 2014, I think. Uh, so this is looking at other causes of malaria among outpatient children in Tanzania in two sites, children aged two months to 10 years. About 9% of them had malaria. Uh, a very thorough study asking about a lot of symptoms, risk factors, and clinical signs, and the final diagnosis based on predefined clinical and microbiological criteria. So an excellent study, obviously published in the New England Journal. And the vast majority of these febrile outpatient children had viral infections. 9% uh, had malaria, 3% typhoid, I think overall about 4% had a bacteremia. But anyway, you're going to hear more about this from Valerie and Blaise tomorrow. So that was 1,000 children, 1,232 diagnoses. So some had more than one diagnosis. And 133 of them had severe illness, of which malaria and typhoid, meningitis, systemic infection. Uh, were the most important. So obviously these are the children who need antibiotics uh, and have high mortality. So I'm going to focus the rest of the talk on children with and adults with bacteremia. So here is a study from Kilifi on the coast in Kenya looking at children admitted uh, with fever. And you can see that... Uh, among those admitted with bacteremia, which was about just under 7%, mortality was 28%. Those without bacteremia, it was 6%. So overall, 26% of deaths in these children were among those with bacteremia. So clearly, this is a group we, ha we must focus on. What were the causes? So pneumococcus, staph, and strep. Uh, group B in the neonates, Haemophilus influenzae, mainly in the under ones. So we've got pneumococcus, non typhi salmonella, and staph up there. Risk factors, severely malnourished children and those with HIV infection were more likely to have some of these infections, in particular pneumococcal infection and non typhi salmonella. This is a nice review done by John Crump and colleagues, a systematic review of bacterial bloodstream infections in Africa. And I don't know, it's probably a bit hard to read. Hopefully these slides will be made available. But the bottom line is that in East Africa, pneumococcus and salmonella 
are clear winners with nearly all the salmonella being non-typhi. Similar in southern Africa, again you have pneumococcus, uh, salmonella non-typhi and staph aureus, and similar in West Africa. So pneumococcus and non-typhoidal salmonella are the key bacteria to focus on in sub-Saharan Africa. In North Africa, it's a bit different. So there were salmonella isolated, nearly all typhi, uh, but also a lot of brucellosis, 26% here. And this is a, an amazing study from Malawi uh, over a period of 18 years, uh, almost 200,000 blood cultures, of which almost 30,000 were positive, looking at the important organisms. So non-typhi salmonella, 36% overall, but going down over the years. And we don't know why this was exactly, but probably something to do with the reducing incidence of malaria, which we'll discuss a bit further whether that's a risk factor. Pneumococcus, uh, second, but again going down here after pneumococcal vaccination was rolled out. And Salmonella typhi, E. coli, Staph aureus, Euclebs yellow, and Cryptococcus, among HIV positives mainly. Other risk factors, sickle cell disease, an important risk factor for invasive bacterial infection, 26 times more likely another study from Khalifi uh, to be admitted with bacteremia if you have sickle cell disease. And of course the other really important risk factor also from Khalifi is being admitted to hospital. Hospitals are dangerous places. So this was a study looking at the incidence of bacteremia among children who had recently been in hospital, comparing it with those in the community showing that they were 40 times as likely to be readmitted with bacteremia than children in the community. And the mortality was twice as high because, of course, many of those bacteria acquired in hospital were multi-resistant. Here is a, a study from Moheza Hospital, which is in northeastern Tanzania, uh, not far from Tanga. Uh, and this is children coming in with fever. So most of them had falciparum malaria, but a lot of them also had invasive bacterial disease and there was considerable overlap. But the point here is that among those with malaria, about 4% died. Among those with positive blood cultures, four or five times as many died. And this is looking at risk factors for particular bacteria being isolated from the blood. So the white is non-typhi salmonella. These are children who have a positive rapid test for malaria but a negative blood film. So they've recently had malaria. These are children with low parasitemias. And in those groups, 70% of blood culture isolates were non-typhi salmonella. So again, you see this same association with malaria. So I think these are the risk factors for bacteremia in children. I put African children, I'm sure it's the same in Asia, except there's probably less sickle cell disease. So severe malnutrition, HIV infection, sickle cell disease, and admission to hospital. And we're seeing also that it seems malaria is a risk factor for bacterial infection. So I'm just going to briefly mention one other study from Khalifi, which I think confirms this very nicely. So this was a case control study. Just under 300 children admitted with a positive blood culture, two healthy controls for each case. And they were typed by hemoglobin electrophoresis. And what they showed was that risk factors for bacteremia as we know, are HIV infection, severe malnutrition, sickle cell disease. This is evidence of recent malaria. And sickle cell trait was appeared to be protective against bacteremia. Now, we know sickle cell trait 
protects against malaria. So is that the reason? And this very nice study. So in 1999, the incidence of malaria was high, uh, about 30 per thousand children per year in this region. And having sickle cell trait meant you were half as likely to be admitted with bacteremia. Over the next eight years, the incidence of malaria went down as bed nets were introduced. So this is the incidence of malaria. And when malaria went away, sickle trait was no longer protective against bacteremia. So I think this shows very clearly that indeed malaria predisposes to positive blood culture, especially with non-typhi salmonella. So uh, you have a severely ill febrile child. You do a blood film or a rapid diagnostic test. He has malaria. You still need to consider invasive bacterial infection. So the question is, you admit your child because she is severely ill. Which antibiotic are you going to give? And this is the difficult part. So this is a study from that same group in Malawi who did almost 200,000 blood cultures. And this is showing the emergence of resistance to chloramphenicol, ampicillin, and cotrimoxazole among salmonella over that period. And just to highlight one of these lines, so this is salmonella typhimurium resistant to chloramphenicol. So the first half of 2001, zero prevalence. By the second half of 2002, 80%, more than 80% were resistant. So this can spread very quickly. So if you look at publications on antimicrobial resistance in Africa, this is between 1990 and 2013. There seem to be quite a lot. 30 from Nigeria, 22 from Senegal, 50 from uh, Kenya. Uh, so it looks impressive, but the problem, of course, is that, as I just showed you, things can change very quickly. So how many have we had in the last five years? Not, not enough is the bottom line. And this is just, again, from the same group in Malawi, so this is pneumococcus. The red is resistant to penicillin, cotrimoxazole, and chloramphenicol. Not many of them. So this is penicillin resistance. And this is Staph aureus. This is MRSA. Again, the red bars are resistant, resistance to all three. So you can see how this is changing over the years. And this is looking at a variety of other bacteria, E. coli here. So the red bars resistant to chloramphenicol, cotrimoxazole, and ampicillin. This is Klebsiella, other enterobacteriaceae, pneumococcus, staph, which we've seen already. So this is a large and increasing problem. Western Kenya, again, looking at non-typhi salmonella. Uh, and you can see, worryingly, that keftaraxone resistance in this particular study, 17 out of 72, or almost 24%. Fortunately, resistance to quinolones is still quite rare in that setting. And this, this just shows the data from that study. So admittedly, the numbers are small. But this is clearly a worrying trend as keftaraxone is recommended as first line in most of these countries. And this is from Democratic Republic of the Congo, uh, where so this is a percentage sensitive of salmonella strains isolated from blood cultures. So only 80% are sensitive to keftaraxone, 92% to ciprofloxacin. And chloramphenicol, amoxicillin are effectively no use anymore. Just a brief couple of slides on the meningitis belt. Uh, General La Pesonie, 
um, was a very famous French doctor who worked in West Africa and described this meningitis belt uh, many years ago in which epidemics of meningococcal meningitis occur every 10 years or so with huge numbers of cases and very high mortality. So we had a major breakthrough. Uh, so here is the epidemic in 2009, 80,000 cases uh, in the meningitis belt that were identified, probably a considerable underestimate. So after this, in 2010, so the, the conjugate meningococcal group A vaccine was introduced. So previous vaccines had been polysaccharide vaccines, which didn't work in young children and only gave short-term protection. So the conjugate vaccine gives long-term protection, is effective in children, and unlike the polysaccharide vaccine, it also reduces carriage. So this seemed like a major breakthrough, and indeed the number of cases went down. But the problem is, you see here, so these are group A, the dark blue ones, and previous epidemics going back to the 1930s were nearly all, well, were essentially all serogroup A. But you bring in the vaccine against that, and now the other serotypes have started to appear. So the vaccine was a great breakthrough, but further work is needed here. And this is a study by our colleague John Crump, who was based in Moshi in Tanzania on the slopes of Mount Kilimanjaro for a number of years. Did a study of inpatient admissions in two hospitals. Uh, and in 60% of them, the clinical diagnosis was malaria but actually only 14 of them had malaria. So this is a certain altitude and malaria transmission is not common in that setting. So on the other hand, just over a quarter of them had a bacterial zoonosis. 16 brucellosis, 40 leptospirosis, 24 Q fever, 36 rickettsia, and also a number of viral infections. So this is an important finding, I think, the importance of zoonotic infections. This was among pastoral communities, uh, mostly Maasai, who keep cows, goats, and sheep. So probably these leptospirosis is susceptible to most first-line antibiotics. So that's not a big worry. Uh, brucellosis, on the other hand, needs long courses of multiple antibiotics, so that is a big worry. And these ones are susceptible to tetracyclines, which are not widely used in Africa currently. So we may need to have a rethink there. Leptospirosis, essentially, or whatever it's been looked for, has been found in both animals and humans. Uh, in this review, between 2 and 20% of inpatients uh, with nonspecific febrile illness had leptospirosis. And this was another very interesting study. So this was a study done in Kampala among HIV-positive patients admitted with severe sepsis. So they mostly had low CD4 counts, you can see here that in about a quarter of them, TB, mycobacterium tuberculosis, was grown from blood cultures. So these are patients coming in with severe sepsis. So some had salmonella, some had pneumococcus, few had staph aureus, cryptococcus, pseudomonas, E. coli, but by far the largest number actually had TB, which would not normally be considered because they didn't have TB symptoms. So how can we improve the diagnosis of TB in severely unwell AIDS patients? So luckily we have now a simple point of care test for the lipoaribomanan LAM antigen. Uh, we have these point of care lateral flow tests, which are both sensitive and specific and were evaluated initially by my colleague Steve Lorne, 
from Cape Town who very sadly died a couple of years ago. And what he showed was that among patients admitted with CD4 count of less than 50, the LAM assay on urine picked up 70% of cases of TB. Uh, and if you combined it with a gene expert, then you were above 80%. So here is a simple point of care test which you can use in patients with advanced AIDS uh, to diagnose TB. And this was published earlier, or sorry, last year by Anka Gupta Wright, who was Steve Lawn's PhD student, uh, looking at the impact of this on mortality of rolling out the LAM test. What he showed essentially was that among those with very low CD4 counts, doing a LAM test reduced mortality. So to summarize, invasive bacterial infections are very common, especially in children. They have a high mortality. These are the risk factors. We've made enormous progress, I think, in the last 20 years. We've seen a 40% reduction in the incidence of malaria and a 60% reduction in mortality due to malaria. A number of vaccines have been rolled out. We've seen how important pneumococcus is as a cause of bacteremia. Uh, so the pneumococcal vaccine will be undoubtedly reducing that, though the question of serotype replacement as with meningococcus is also a concern. And Haemophilus influenzae, an important cause of mortality in very young children under one, that vaccine is now rolled out. ART, clearly, a uh, huge increase in the number of people on ART, which will reduce those HIV-associated invasive bacterial infections. We have point-of-care tests for malaria, HIV, TB, which we've talked about, cryptococcal meningitis. A number of papers have been published identifying biomarkers associated with bacterial infections. I will, we'll be hearing, I hope, a lot more about that in the next couple of days from Kevin Kane and the FIND people. And clinical algorithms have been shown to reduce antibiotic prescription without affecting outcomes. And I think Blaise and Valerie will be telling us about their excellent studies on that in Tanzania. However, many challenges remain. So rapid spread of antimicrobial resistance in those pathogens is a serious concern which could undo all that progress that we've made in the last 20 years. The incidence of malaria seems to have plateaued. It's no longer going down. Insecticide resistance, resistance to antimalarials is a concern. Serotype replacement, I've mentioned, we roll out the vaccines, that's wonderful, but new serotypes may come along, so further research is needed. Clearly, there are regions of conflict, as, as we heard earlier, uh, where access is a problem and an uncertain funding environment. But I think for the clinician, essentially, the problem is, here is a febrile patient if I'm not going to admit this patient because she doesn't seem particularly unwell, do I need to give her an antibiotic? How can we decide that? Clinical algorithms, biomarkers, perhaps point-of-care tests may help. And if we decide the patient is sick enough to warrant admission, clearly they need an antibiotic, but which one should we give? Well, the answer is it depends where we are, what the risk factors were, are, and what the antimicrobial susceptibility pattern is in that particular area. So we need more studies on causes of fever in different populations in different settings. And I think we'll be talking a lot about that in the next couple of days. We clearly need to roll out global surveillance. And the work done by Fundacion Merio is very encouraging. Uh, but more needs to be done so that we know our local antimicrobial susceptibility patterns. We need to keep working on vaccines, developing new ones and evaluating them, and evaluation of new biomarkers to identify patients who need antibiotics in different settings. <laughs>
So what works in London may not work in in Nairobi, let's say. So we need to do this in different settings. New point of care tests, either for specific infections or to decide who needs an antibiotic are needed. We've made great progress on that, but further work is needed. Uh, and development and evaluation of new clinical algorithms for the management of fever in different settings. And finally, uh, which I'm not going to talk about, new strategies for the control and elimination of malaria, where we, progress seems to have stalled in the last two or three years. And that's all I have to say. Thank you for your attention. And I look forward to very good discussions over the next couple of days. So now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Shamin Kazi. He's 